Hello and welcome to part one of Neurosensory for Clinical Cases. Today we're going to be looking at the first 10 clinical cases that we were taught about in Neuro of second year. So let's get started. We start with brown saccade syndrome. So brown saccade syndrome is a lesion in the spinal cord which results in weakness or paralysis on one side of the body and a loss of sensation on the opposite side of the body. And for this reason we refer, we refer to it as a hemicord lesion. A normal cause of brown scar syndrome is trauma, and therefore in terms of treatment or management of a condition, we're really looking at treating the immediate life-threatening conditions first, as opposed to the actual syndrome. Following that, steroids then may be useful in order to reduce the inflammation that the syndrome is causing. In terms of recovery, this is varied from patient to patient. So some patients take a long time to um, recover, um, and some take very little time. And this is really due to the extent of the nerve damage uh, and the underlying cause of the syndrome. As we've said, there's total ipsilateral loss of positioning, so proprioception, light touch and vibration, and on the other side, on a contralateral loss of pain and temperature. Um, and this makes sense in terms of the um, tracks which these are transferred to the brain. Myasthenia gravis is what we're looking at next. So this is a chronic autoimmune neuromuscular disease, which causes weakness in skeletal muscles uh, that are responsible, for example, for our breathing or moving our arms and legs. Uh, and also the weakness worsens after a period of activity. So how can we treat it? So medication um, is often used to help improve the muscle weakness of the patient. And also surgery to remove the thymus glands is also quite common. Um, and in terms of how we just said, it becomes worse after a period of activity or when the patient's stressed. Therefore, the patient can take measures to reduce that stress, reduce that tiredness in order to manage their symptoms better and more effectively. What do we expect to see with someone with myasthenia gravis? You'd expect to see someone with droopy eyelids, um, double vision, difficulty making facial expressions, slurred speech, weak arms, legs or neck, etc. And when we think about a drooping eyelid, another word for this is ptosis, okay? And it's due to a weakness of the levator palpebrae superioris muscle, which is the muscle that elevates the superior eyelid and it is innervated by the oculomotor nerve. So as we've said, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune condition and what this means is the body is attacking itself. The autoimmune system of the body, the immune system of the body is attacking itself. And this damages the communication between the nerves and the muscles leading to weakness. Um, there are also links to the thymus gland being larger than normal. Uh, the true cause of this is unknown, but that is why sometimes we remove the thymus gland as part of the surgery and treatment. Next, we're going to look at Parkinson's, which is a long-term neurodegenerative disorder of the central nervous system that mainly affects the motor aspect of the system. So Parkinson's is a loss of nerve cells in the brain, which are responsible for controlling voluntary movement. So when we think about voluntary movement, we're thinking about the substantia nigra in the basal ganglia. And this is what is going to de degenerate in Parkinson's disease. With a sufferer of Parkinson's, you'd expect three distinct symptoms. So first of all, you'd expect a tremor or shaking, which usually begins in the hand or the arm. You'd expect a bradykinesia or a slowness of moving or movement. It can result in that slow shuffling walk you expect to see with a patient with Parkinson's. And lastly, you'd expect rigidity of the muscles, muscle stiffness, okay, and tension in the muscles which can make it difficult for them to move around and pull facial expressions. Arguably, whether it's genetics or environment, it does run in families as a result of a faulty gene being passed from the parent to the child. However, it's rare for the disease to be inherited in this way. And um, so therefore, we might be looking at more environmental causes for the disease as opposed to genetics. In terms of treatment or management, um, supportive therapies such as physiotherapy go quite a long way. Medication to reduce tremors and help with the bradykinesia. And also some people do undergo surgery, however, this is more rare. Next, we're looking at Wallenberg's. So this is a syndrome that's got a few names. So you could call it Wallenberg syndrome, Pica syndrome, or lateral medullary syndrome. So Pica, posterior, inferior, cerebellar artery. Okay, arteries of the brainstem. So Wallenberg's is a stroke in the vertebral or Pica arteries of the brain stem. Okay, and the outcome is varied. So some people's symptoms will improve and some people's will worsen over time. Um, the main symptoms is dysphagia, so difficulty swallowing. But you may find that patients with Wallenberg syndrome also experience nausea, rapid eye movements, also called nystagmus, 
and paralysis or numbness on one side of the body. There's no cure for this condition, however, um, and therefore it may focus on speech and swallowing therapy in order to help you learn to swallow again in a way that, um, for example, if one side of your body has been affected by this disease, it may help you to learn to swallow um, on the opposite side in order to swallow safely. Um, also, pain medication can help to treat those um, who've got chronic or long-lasting pain related to this syndrome. Next, we've got subdural hematoma. In the case of this, an injury to the bridging vein, um, and it's causing a blood accumulation between the dura matter and the pyroarachnoid matter. The diagnosis can be made using an MRI scan. However, some doctors will also use a CT in order to check if there's been a skull fracture, which is a very common cause um, of a subdural hematoma. So a head injury really is your major cause there. Um, symptoms, you'll find your patient has got a headache, which continues to get worse, uh, feeling or being sick, and also the patient may be confused with personality changes, um, which is common. And obviously communication with the family is really essential there because obviously if the patient's being aggressive, is this normal for the patient or is this unusually aggressive? What are the risk factors with subdural hematoma? Obviously it can just be unlucky, you could fall and have a head injury. Alternatively, increased alcohol consumption, increasing age and blood thinning medicine and epilepsy are all um, risk factors which increase your chance of having a subdural hematoma. Next we look at an aneurysm. <clears throat> so this is a localised blood-filled balloon-like bulge in the wall of a blood vessel. It can put pressure on surrounding nerves or brain tissue, which is where the danger comes from, but also it could leak, causing a hemorrhage. There are three types of aneurysm that you need to be aware of. Um, so these are described on the left-hand side here, but also you can see them in the images on the right-hand side, and they correspond quite nicely. So saccular aneurysm can be seen just here, which is bulging at one side of the artery. The fusiform aneurysm, uh, this is a single-shaped distension. Okay, This occurs mainly in the abdominal aorta. And lastly, a dissecting aneurysm, which occurs mainly in the arch of the aorta. Um, so there are symptoms for unruptured and ruptured, which is really useful in terms of spotting it before it ruptures, because obviously we don't want it to rupture, particularly in those vital arteries. So symptoms of unruptured, thinking like loss of vision and double vision, pain around the eye, numbness or weakness on one side of your face, difficulty speaking, headaches, and symptoms when it's ruptured, you'd expect the patient to be feeling or being sick, stiff neck, neck pain, sensitivity to light, um, some are common, so for example, double vision is common in both. But as you can see, the symptoms for the ruptured aneurysm are much more severe, which you'd expect. Um, in terms of increased risk of developing an aneurysm, people who smoke, people who have high blood pressure, and um, but also people who have a family history of aneurysms um, are also more likely to be sufferers. Next, we look at strabismus. So this is also called crossed eyes, uh, and it can be intermittent or constant. Failure of, it's basically failure of the two eyes to maintain proper alignment. Um, so one eye focuses on the object you're viewing, while the other looks in an alternate direction, so it's misaligned. So it could be looking upwards, downwards, or to either side. There are two types of strabismus. So you've got syndromic strabismus or isolated strabismus. So syndromic strabismus, um, this is a common um, mild form, such as Duran syndrome. Um, Alternatively, you have isolated strabismus, which is 90% idiopathic. You don't need to know much about either of those, just that they exist, the two types of strabismus. Genetics is a possible cause for strabismus. Okay, so this is inappropriate with development of the fusion centre of the brain. Um, however, most cases of strabismus are not a result of muscle problems, but due to the brain, so an injury of the brain. Uh, treatment or management should be directed at the source of a problem, so the eye doctor must determine if the strabismus is due to a um, seeing problem or a brain problem. Okay, so sometimes um, patients simply will need glasses to correct this, uh, bifocal glasses. Alternatively, you could try eye exercises, and sometimes surgery is completed on the eye also. Neurofibromatosis is the next one we're going to talk about. So this is a growth of a tumour along the nerves. 50% um, of these are caused by genetics and 50% are caused are spontaneous. Uh, there are two types as well, so there's neurofibromatosis type 1 and neurofibromatosis type 2. Um, type 1 is much more common than type 2 uh, and they do have different symptoms so they can be distinguished quite easily in clinical practice. Unfortunately there's no cure for neurofibromatosis type 1 um, but treatment involves regularly monitoring and treating any um, problems that occur. 
So a common uh, theme here with the neurosensory block is actually monitoring the patient. Um, it's not always about treating the problem directly. Sometimes surgery is an option for quite a lot of these conditions. However, a lot of it is about monitoring and checking, well, what's coming up? What problem is the patient experiencing? And is it related to this disease, so neurofibromatosis, for example? Next, we're going to look at the Chiari malformation. So um, this is a downward displacement of the cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum. Um, and it can sometimes cause non-communicating hydrocephalus as well, because obviously if the cerebellar tonsils did depress down into the foramen magnum, um, it would cause a blockage, a CSF obstruction, and therefore would cause non-communicating non hydrocephalus. Um, the treatment or management, uh, if there are no symptoms, you may not need any um, treatment here, um, because simply a chiro malformation may not be causing any problems, but obviously if it is causing an issue such as non-communicating hydrocephalus, therefore treatment will be needed. Okay, uh, and usually um, a patient with chiro malformation will undergo decomp decompression surgery. Next we have encephalitis. This is the final one we're going to talk about in this video. Um, it's rather uncommon, but it's a serious condition in which the bra brain um, becomes inflamed. Okay, so it swells, it becomes bigger. Um, and it's due to usually a viral infection, such as measles, varicella, or the herpes simplex virus. Uh, symptoms for the patient, they may be confused or disorientated. They may have seizures or fits. Um, they may have changes to their personality and behavior, and they may have difficulty speaking. Um, as we've said, it's caused by a viral infection, um, but ultimately it's a problem with the immune system um, um, a lot of the time, and it mistakenly attacks the brain, which causes the inflammation. Um, you can also have bacterial and fungal forms of encephalitis, have a small there, um, but it's not contagious, which is obviously quite important. Um, it does need to be treated in a hospital, and treatment depends on the course. So you could have antiviral medication, you could have steroid injections, and you could have treatment to control the immune system. So there's quite a range of treatments here, which can be tailored to the cause um, of the encephalitis. Um, essentially, however, if you note, we said it's usually caused by a viral infection, so measles, for example. And what's really important there is, of course, we can prevent this by having the MMR jab when we're young. So there are measures we can take in order to prevent developing encephalitis. And that's all for this video. Join us next time when we look at some more of the clinical cases from the neurosensory block uh, in part two. Thank you for listening. And of course, as always, if you do have any feedback, please feel free to leave them in the comments below um, or let me know in person if you see me around. Thank you very much.